Hello, everyone. How are you? Warming up. It's cold out there already. Um, I'm really happy to be here today with all of you and introduce Ethan Catch to you, uh, who's a long-term uh, Berkman friend and contributor to our community. He's currently uh, the director of the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, is a professor emeritus at UMass Amherst, um, and most importantly, we, which brings us to the topic of today, also the co-author of a great book called Digital Justice, Technology and the Internet of Disputes, uh, co-authored with Orna uh, Rabinovic. I highly recommend this book. You actually have some flyers uh, on, on your tables with a discount, I may, may add. Um, this book is one of the books where you walk away uh, uh, and depending on the mood of the day when you read it, you're leaving more optimistic or sometimes more pessimistic depending on the mood of the day. So be careful when you read it uh, because in one way the book uh, tracks actually and tells the story, the history of the internet as a story of more and more disputes and certainly these days I feel very much we have an abundance of disputes uh, not only looking at the commercial web, uh, like the good old eBay uh, problems of disputes between buyers and sellers, uh, but of course when we look at social media, when we talk about hate speech and harassment and cyberbullying and disagreements about um, you know uh, ratings and, and and many other things, so so it's a, in a way a history of, of disputes. But on the other hand, side on the more optimistic note. Uh, it's also a book that tells us the story that the same technology can actually be used not only to resolve disputes, but also to prevent them and to mitigate them. And to me, that's a particularly timely topic uh, as we are facing as a society, but of course, particularly also the provider of platforms face so many design choices uh, uh, and have to consider what's in the repertoire available how we can use digital technology to actually create a more peaceful uh, world and, and a more harmonious society, to borrow a, a Chinese term. Now, there's no one better, actually, than Ethan uh, to, to tell this story. Uh, Ethan is a true pioneer, uh, a thought leader, when it comes um, to the field of dispute resolution online. Uh, he was among the pioneers, actually, of eBay's uh, famous dispute resolution systems, uh, which he developed, helped develop and test, uh, I think in the late 90s, that feels a uh, very long time ago, much has happened since, and so uh, I couldn't be more excited to, to hear the story uh, from you, uh, where have we arrived and, and what's ahead? Uh, digital justice, thanks for being here, Ethan, I'm looking forward to your talk. That's extremely... <laughs> Uh, extremely kind of you, Urs, uh, but I think you've summarized the whole book already. <laughs> uh, we uh, almost, uh, actually we struggled with the title, and uh, one day we thought we'd call it Digital Injustice, then we ba went back to Digital Justice. Uh, I suppose it could have been called either one, but uh, we felt better with uh, the title Digital Justice than Injustice. Uh, so, uh, I, was in, I was in Brussels recently giving a talk and uh, afterwards a member of the audience came up to me and asked me this question, where does justice take place? And uh, he didn't give me a chance to answer because he said justice takes place here. This is the largest courthouse in the world. And I said, well, I think this is the largest courthouse in the world. And, or this, uh, or something in the cloud. But uh, I told him I thought he was making a mistake in thinking that this was just a phone. Uh, this is uh, a chameleon. It can, be, it can be a courthouse, it can be almost anything. Uh, all it takes is some imagination. So. Uh, I put 
put this uh, courthouse inside the phone. Not very professionally, I know. <laughs> but still, I sent this off to him, and I haven't heard from him since. Uh, this is uh, the essence of the book. Uh, not simply digital justice, but access to justice. And uh, there's no uh, shorter, more succinct statement about access to justice than, than Kafka. The law should be accessible to everyone at all times. Uh, the problem with that big courthouse, which turns out uh, not to be the big co biggest courthouse in the world. Uh, the biggest courthouse in the world is in Turkey for some reason. Uh, but the problem with uh, that courthouse is that uh, gets a small percentage of disputes. So we're, in, we're dealing with, um, we're dealing with uh, a level of conflict that's extraordinarily high. Uh, I think when we started writing the book, it was a little less obvious than it is today. Uh, I don't think we have to make a, it's not hard to make a persuasive uh, statement about uh, being worried, really, about the level of conflict online. Uh, but what, what do we do about this? So there are um, efforts. Um, before we get to that, this is uh, basically the, the model uh, that most people in the dispute resolution field think uh, figuratively represents what's happening. Very few d disputes at the top. Alter ADR, alternative dispute resolution, uh, mediation, negotiation, or arbitration, somewhat more. And then basically, uh, most people have to figure out for themselves what to do with their problems. So if you have a problem with your uh, car mechanic, uh, that's on you. Nobody's going to get inside that huge courthouse in Brussels or any courthouse in this country uh, for less than um, quite a few thousand dollars unless you uh, go to a mediation center uh, or maybe possibly a small claims court. But I'm having a, a little trouble with the screen uh, or getting used to the screen. But uh, there, are, if, if uh, I hadn't persuaded you thus far that there are lots of disputes, uh, these are basically disputes that have been resolved. And uh, Alibaba has overtaken eBay for a number of years. eBay boasted it handled 60 million disputes a year, obviously without human intervention. Alibaba claims not only 100 million, but a higher success rate. ODR. Yeah, 95% with ODR, online dispute resolution. Uh, China imposes uh, pressures parties to settle more than eBay does. So that accounts for that. Uh, Resolver is a, a British company that's been in business only for two years. Uh, it's growing rapidly. And Resolver, uh, reason for being is to help people make, com make complaints. Now that may strike you as an odd business model. Uh, because many of you probably think you know how to complain, uh, but sometimes it's not so easy to, com to find who to complain to. Certainly hard to find, hard to find uh, telephone numbers or addresses uh, online. And uh, Resolver has a list of uh, 100,000 uh, individuals at, at British companies who uh, who you can complain to, and they help you, and they automate the, the process. Um, League of Legends, are there any League of Legends players here? <coughs> One. <laughs> One who's willing to admit it, or two. Uh, League of Legends has 67 million users. Um, they realized at some point that they were not going to uh, be able to thrive if people got into uh, conflicts with each other. So they have an online jury system. And um, then there's Wikipedia, which um, many of you know about, how it's a very elaborate system of resolving disputes. American Arbitration Association handled uh, 100,000 
all, as I should make clear, all of this uh, online, uh, sometimes with a, a little human intervention, eBay, some per small percentage are handled uh, by humans, but mostly uh, online. And um, on my screen, half of the screen is red and half, uh, half is not red. Are you seeing that? No. No. <laughs> all black. Uh, I have no idea why. Uh, but uh, the, red, the red on my screen goes down to uh, the American Arbitration Association and then becomes black with the domain name disputes and the sharing economy and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, that's in black because uh, those entities or processes, in my opinion at least, uh, don't work as well and haven't worked as well and they're not necessarily as fair as, as the ones at the top. And then you get down to uh, one at the bottom, which I just stuck here. We'll deal with this later. AT&T has 120 million mobile phone customers, and uh, its arbitration system attracted the grand number of 27 out of 120 million. So, uh, or is meant to, mentioned uh, that uh, disputes on the internet are fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, if you date the internet back to 1969, uh, you find that really, um, for the first 25 years or so, uh, there were no disputes. Uh, and if you're interested in dispute resolution, it's an interesting case study of what kind of infrastructure is needed in order for them not to settle disputes, but for not, there not to be any disputes at all. So when academics and the military were in charge of things, and the US government prohibited uh, the use of the net for e-commerce, uh, where, where do you get disputes? There were no students online. Students generated a lot of disputes. Uh, there was no one, no customers online because there were no, there was no e-commerce. Uh, there, there was a social network of sorts, an informal one. People who could use the net used it to communicate, but nothing, uh, no social network of the kind we see. Uh, and there were, of course, in the 80s, uh, some cases that did go to court, mostly, mostly copyright cases. Well, this, uh, this changed rapidly in uh, the last uh, 10 to 20 years, uh, so much so that uh, Mr. Kapoor is embarrassed by this statement. Uh, but I don't think he really should be embarrassed, because if you're back in 1993, uh, it was fair enough to think, this is, uh, this is good. We don't have to do anything to make this good. This is inherently good. And uh, unfortunately, it's not inherently good. Uh, the point about disputes is uh, you don't have to really do anything to generate disputes. Uh, you have to do a lot to resolve disputes and even more to prevent disputes. But if you want to set up an environment where um, there are lots of disputes, take a look at the internet. Uh, it doesn't require huge... Uh, huge uh, strategies. So uh, how can we improve access to, to what we call justice? Um, we need more tools. Um, most of all, I think we need the last thing. Uh, we need a new focus on preventing disputes. Uh, mediators and arbitrators uh, almost have nothing to do with preventing disputes. Uh, because those are private, confidential processes. So if you think about uh, trying to find patterns in areas where there are lots of disputes, eBay does that. Uh, that takes some effort, but confidentiality is, uh, is threatened by that. If you're strictly a mediator, again, uh, you're not going to be able to handle huge numbers of cases of the kind we had here. So what happens? Why is there? Why do we need these uh, dispute resolution processes? Uh, why would Alibaba bother setting up a system to handle 100 million or uh, 
eBay 60 million, or in these areas, which we uh, are sort of case studies that we devote cha a chapter in each two in the book, why are they concerned with uh, disputes? And, and it's a rather simple answer, and that is, uh, if you're going to enter a disputing environment, you're entering an environment that uh, brings some risk. Uh, you want to enter a safe environment. And um, there is this uh, statement by someone at Facebook who was here a few weeks ago. I, I don't buy into uh, the validity of this <laughs> statement, uh, but it does represent uh, clearly the, the rationale for why we need dispute resolution um, processes. Basically, we want people to feel safe when using Facebook. Uh, when I first got involved with eBay, and I have, haven't been involved with them for 10 or more years, uh, the question with eBay at the start was, why would anybody buy anything from somebody they didn't know who was located at a distance? Uh, and uh, how could you, what could you do to help them feel safer? And the answer was, you could promise them that if they resolve disputes, if they have a dispute, you'll, you'll resolve them. Uh, we're... I'm sorry. I'm, uh, somehow this uh, is taken off by itself. I'm blaming the technology. Uh, so uh, the access to justice issue, um, we've seen it before. Uh, in, in the mid-70s and early 80s, uh, people in this building, or not this building, but this university, I've got a very sensitive... Uh, piece of device here, uh, uh, f discovered the same thing that uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, namely that the courts are overloaded. They can't handle things. Uh, therefore, things should be handled privately. And uh, mediation and arbitration were the, um, the choices there. Uh, alternative dispute resolution became a model for online dispute resolution some years later. Uh, <coughs> uh, I think uh, those of you who are more interested in, who are interested in ODR or online dispute resolution uh, can look at it carefully as it's branched, branched out from, from ADR. If you want to know how eBay resolves disputes, here's uh, a simple example. Uh, the eBay system is impressive, but really it's impressive only in terms of numbers. It's, it's not impressive in terms of complexity. Uh, so eBay simply uses forms, uh, and the goal of these forms is twofold. One is to clarify what the dispute is about. More importantly, uh, it's designed to allow the parties to communicate civilly with each other. Uh, the vast majority of disputes between buyers and sellers are based on miscommunication or accidents. Uh, but almost everyone who uh, makes a purchase on eBay and finds it uh, not uh, to their liking, almost everyone thinks they've been defrauded. So uh, the key goal is to persuade the parties to talk enough so that they realize they haven't been defrauded these forms enable them to focus in on, on what, uh, what kind of solutions, solution there might be. And um, you, end up with, uh, you end up with 60 million. Uh, so one uh, current ex example of um, an access to uh, hopefully justice, but maybe injustice. This is a case that's uh, uh, potentially going to the Supreme Court. It went to the Supreme Court once, and it was set, sent down for a technical reason about standing. Um, but uh, Mr. Robbins, you, anybody know Spokio? Familiar with it? It's a bad place. <laughs> so. So if you uh, are represented there, I would get out of there. Uh, unless you, f you can tell me later you found, find it different. 
Uh, Spokio is a, what's called a people search engine. You can search for people on Google, but you're not going to find as much about them as you will on, on Spokio. And uh, this Thomas Robbins uh, looked himself up on Spokio, found that there was almost nothing that was accurate ab about him. Uh, his age was wrong. His economic well-being was wrong. His, his job situation was wrong. He wasn't married. He didn't have children. Uh, his expertise was off. Uh, and Mr. Spokio sued based on the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So it's one of the, the few uh, federal statutes we have uh, that help with accuracy, and promote accuracy in records. Um, if you're interested later, I can talk about the issue of how, how to correct records because uh, in healthcare, in e-commerce, uh, almost in every chapter of the book, there's an issue with re records not necessarily being stolen and not records of the, um, based on problems with privacy, but records based on accuracy. And if records are not accurate, judgments and decisions made on the basis of those records are going to be mistakes. So Mr. Spokio runs the uh, risk of, of being turned down for a mortgage, for example. So uh, this uh, statement in the Fair Credit Reporting Act required to them to follow reasonable procedures to ensure maximum possible accuracy of the information that it makes available for use in credit reports. Uh, seems to uh, be a violation of Mr. Spokio. But um, the district court, federal district court, uh, denied him relief. Uh, the Court of Appeals changed, reversed that, and granted him uh, what relief. And then it went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court uh, sent it back down to the Court of Appeals because it said, there's no real concrete proof that he's been injured. Well, how many of you think that he's, he's been injured? If you were in this situation, would you think you've been injured? I would have guessed more. Um, but um, so the court says he hasn't been injured. There's this false information about him, but no, no basic injury. Uh, so um, this case was decided in his favor by the Court of Appeals the second time it went to them. Uh, and uh, it's unclear whether uh, Spokio will try to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court or not. Uh, but it seems to me a, an example in the legal system of, of trying to secure access to justice. And um, this is not a trivial case. Uh, the number of uh, amicus briefs filed in this case probably are 50. And uh, all of the big players filed amicus briefs on, on Spokio's behalf. I think most of us would have preferred that uh, they filed briefs supporting Mr. Robbins. Um, but all of them, uh, I think it reveals something about them. Uh, all of them are afraid of more lawsuits, and uh, they've all filed a lot of uh, retainers of lawyers, uh, and they've all filed uh, briefs in support of Spokio. So the case was sent back and uh, recently decided in Mr. Spokio's uh, uh, behalf. So uh, just um, two more slides. And I think I've used up my time. Um, digital injustice as well as justice. Yes, there's uh, hard to know, as I said, whether to call this book Digital Injustice or, or Digital Justice. Uh, the underlying issue, as I, I think I've said already, is that uh, conflicts, uh, it, it doesn't take any special action to generate a conflict. Uh, if you have a transaction, if you have a relationship, 
if uh, some entity has a billion members, there are inevitably going to be uh, disputes. Whether those entities that have a billion users uh, design systems appropriately is a lot harder. And then, of course, there are uh, those entities that think that terms of service can cover all of this and that that can prevent disputes. So here are my two worst examples. First, from uh, Partners Healthcare. How many of you uh, be belong to Partners Healthcare? Mass General, Brigham and Wig Women's. So how many of you used their online patient portal? So you've agreed to this. In the event of any problem with Patient Gateway, that's their portal, or any of its content, you agree that your sole remedy is to cease using Patient Gateway. Under no circumstances shall partners or any partner's affiliate be liable in any way for your use of Patient Gateway or of any of its content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in any content. I, I find that so egregious that uh, I don't know what to say more about it. But I will say one, one more thing about it, and that is, uh, all of us uh, should take a look at our online medical records. Uh, probably almost all of you have access to your medical records online, either through Patient Gateway or Beth Israel's, uh, which is called Patient Site. And um, the interesting thing about these records uh, online is that when you look at your record, it will probably be the first time in your life that you've seen your medical record. Uh, I haven't encountered anyone who uh, had access to their, or who asked for access to their paper manila folder record, even though federal law requires physicians to, uh, to make them available. But all of our uh, records are online, and people are seeing for the first time that there are lots of mistakes. Uh, my wife was record, said she had diabetes, which Fortunately, she didn't have. Uh, my own record said I had an anxiety attack that caused me to go to the hospital in 2005. I don't know where they got this from. <laughs> uh, and the problem with uh, medical records, it's almost impossible to correct them. Um, because you're not allowed to delete anything from a medical record in case litigation ensues. So uh, they might, uh, if, if your medical record contains an error and you complain enough, uh, they may put it at the end of the record so that anybody interested in your record will have to scroll down 10, uh, ten screens. Um, but I urge you to take a look, see your record. Uh, the other one, the one mentioned uh, earlier, AT&T's arbitration system. Well, at and is not alone. Uh, terms of service for uh, any wireless carrier and any bank uh, will mandate the use of arbitration, which means that it will not allow uh, class action lawsuits if you're injured. Uh, in, in theory, there's nothing wrong with arbitration, but nobody uses it. And then some, there is something wrong with that. And uh, AT&T is, is not alone. Uh, the agency that was established uh, during the Obama administration, the Consumer Finance Protection Agency, uh, banned the use of uh, these clauses in uh, commercial contracts, consumer contracts, uh, not wireless contracts, but uh, credit card contracts. Um, but the Trump administration either has recently or is about to get that off the books. So uh, if you want to complain, you have to ask for arbitration. And the problem with that is uh, it's going to go uh, nowhere. So I think uh, my half hour is up. Thank you very much. Obviously, if anybody has any questions, uh, that's what the rest of the time is for. 
Thank you. And I uh, feel encouraged and provoked <laughs> by your presentation to ask the first question, if I may. Yeah. And it, it goes back essentially to your first slide yeah. with the, um, the courthouse, uh, building. courthouse building in, in, in the smartphone. And the question is twofold and centers around the, the, the terminology also a little bit, um, digital justice. Um, first of all, the first question is, your presentation um, has focused strongly on disputes and, and the question of dispute resolution and, and also to some extent prevention. And I, I'm wondering whether you could comment a little bit more about the relationship between disputes and justice and, and yeah. these two concepts. Or the first uh, so on, uh, most people look at justice in, in two ways, not, not entirely consistent ways. Uh, one, substantively, asking basically whether the outcome was just. And uh, we've done a little of that, but that hasn't been our focus. Uh, the other way to look at access to justice is, is to look at access. Uh, does one who feels aggrieved have an opportunity to correct uh, the problem that has caused them, uh, problem that exists for them? Um, that's the, the Kafkaesque uh, model of access to justice. and. Uh, that's the one we chose to devote more space to than, than the other one. Which is also a great segue to my next question, which is more justice as a process, right? You mentioned there yeah. is the output component, there is the access component. And, and, and this now directly relates to the title digital justice. Would yeah. you say that somehow the digital vision that you sketch also in the book, of course, in, in much more detail, reflects back on what justice may mean in the digital age. Is there some sort of uh, a technological feedback loop on the very concept of justice? Also looking at the eBay snapshot you provided where it's a form and not necessarily uh, a rhetorical space of arguments uh, that seem to determine justice. Yeah, I, I think uh, one thing I would say is that we're in early stage of, of um, trying to figure out, really, how do we handle uh, these challenges to justice based on what occurs uh, online. Uh, really, uh, all of the activity in this space that we talk about, or almost all of the activity, is pretty recent. Facebook doesn't get started until 2007. Uh, Amazon and eBay get started quickly in 1995, um, but still, it's fairly recent. So we don't have we don't have a good array of processes uh, to look at. We have the array uh, that I had on the screen, uh, half of which, I, I, my opinion, are, are severely lacking. Uh, we could have, for example a domain name dispute process that actually involved uh, domain name holders and uh, challengers to those domain names to reach a reasonable solution. But instead, as many of you may know, uh, the trademark owner wins 85% of the time. So I think that's, that's an online dispute resolution process. I'd say it's a, a flawed process. Um, but I have, I mean, sometimes this does, I admit, depress me, but one thing I'm optimistic about is that we will see uh, some creativity in designing processes. Maybe artificial intelligence may be the next yeah. frontier, well, both uh, in terms of process, problems, and solutions. Yeah, so um, AI and algorithms are are big issues for people designing these systems. And the challenge is, as I said, transactions generate disputes. So what, you know, this is a question we don't answer in the book. How do you deal with an uh, algorithm that somehow you think is leading to a, a result you don't care for? 
Thank you. Let me open up here. Questions, comments? Hi there. Thanks for your great comments. Um, Jessica Field from the Cyberlock Clinic here. So we um, deal with a lot of our clients are interested in um, the possibility of online dispute resolution, and we've found that the tools that are available seem to deal really well with sort of simple disputes that often have monetary resolutions, but don't always deal with other kinds of um, both objectives that clients might have, um, like having a public forum in which to air grievances or merely an opportunity to feel heard or the possibility of some sort of injunctive relief. Um, are there systems that you're aware of that are either like under development or um, even currently available that deal a little better with that broader universe of concerns than mere sort of haggling over like how much do you owe me for um, not yeah. sending the merchandise that I thought I had ordered? Well, first of all, uh, a desire to be heard is really one of the core elements of, of a valid dispute resolution process. So offline, uh, one of the things mediators struggle with is to make sure the parties have had the, this, this ability to be heard. Um, you're, you're right in, in one respect. Uh, the disputes, the, the many, many millions of disputes, uh, as I said, actually are easy disputes. Uh, they involve goods, the sale of goods. Uh, there are other disputes, you know, other so-called uh, sharing economy platforms, uh, t like TaskRabbit, for example, which generates lots of disputes, uh, but not goods rather services, and uh, services, you know, goods are either or. Uh, services uh, are harder to resolve. You may think you've done a good job doing something, and whoever hired you may think you've done a terrible job. Uh, I think we haven't had, uh, we've certainly tried to have forums, large forums, uh, in which a lot of people can be heard. Uh, you know, many public, many, many people who are experts at facilitating large, uh, large, large groups to resolve a problem um, have an interest in, in doing it online and actually have been doing some of it online. There may be people here from the program on negotiation who uh, who have a, something to say about that. So, but I'd say, first of all, you know, if you uh, walk across uh, about 100 feet away, there is the program on negotiation, and those people are experts. And I've, I've, I confess, I've tried for years to uh, get them to be interested in the Berkman Center and haven't found anybody really eager. So maybe you can make that your mission. Uh, the, the other thing is, um, you, you, the Cyberlock Clinic had a big victory last year in a case we talk about in the book, and that is um, people who uh, people who have devices implanted in their bodies and uh, and don't own the data that's wirelessly sent off from those devices in their body. And you guys uh, did get an exception so that your clients could actually have access to, um, to the data generated by, by them, which seems, again, something obvious, but uh, the law wasn't on their side. And it's, it's still, you won, but I'm not sure everybody would win. Um, you know, th those are cases that involve complex issues. <coughs> and there's no reason you can't handle those. Um, you know, online. So I, I think in terms of uh, our having, being more optimistic that we'll have uh, systems that can handle more complex disputes, absolutely. Anybody else? Um, so the question is, you know, the YouTube's in the news. We're back now regarding 
how they take down the ad revenue. Most of the news is saying there isn't anything comparable. The other side is saying because it's an ad revenue, not how an escrow is new situation. So the question is, do you see a comparable example or company or court case for the current YouTube disputes? Yeah, so um, I forget, what, was, what did YouTube do in the last day or two? Took down a whole category of? Uh, the YouTube Kids category, which was basically blacklisted, not whitelisted, and there's a lot of stuff getting through that shouldn't have been on yeah. there. So uh, <coughs> I think one of the uh, challenges in, in all of this is you know, we've got uh, guarantees of freedom of the press. We you know, innately don't like government interfering with, um, with expression. And we may feel even stronger about that, given what the administration says about these things. On the other hand, uh, the environment we're dealing with here is different from the environment that existed 20 years ago, and forget about 200 years ago. So personally, uh, I have no problem with YouTube taking down you know, serious, ish, serious um, images that, that children are looking at. Uh, where do you draw the line? You know, it's, don't ask me that question. It's, uh, uh, to it's, to clarify, you are going to ask it. With, just to, to clarify, the other situation is more like you have a person recording a video, a video of a game. The game company disputes it. The YouTuber has all of their um, ad revenue pulled for a week. So it's like the whole... That's a whole yeah. major dispute resolution thing. Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out if there are any good guys out there. Yeah. Um, when you look at the statistics on the AT&T and the, and the language from, from partners, they, they seem to violate... Um, the statute that most states have about unfair or deceptive acts. Uh, on its face is, is the fact that you have an arbitration system with 120 million mobile phones but only 27 cases. Is there anyone out there trying to make a, a case that the system itself is either unfair or deceptive? Well, maybe the cyber law clinic wants to take <laughs> this on. But the problem is you've agreed to this. Okay? You weren't coerced into agreeing to this. You don't have to look at your medical record online. Uh, this isn't, I'm not saying something I, I believe is good. I, I think the defense is, uh, you agreed to that. They made their site available to you. If I were a physician, uh, I, I frankly don't know why physicians aren't angry about this. They don't know about this. I, I don't. You know, probably no one knows about this. Um, but I, I, I don't read all of these terms of service. No human being could, could read all of them. But, but if you do pick out the, uh, the big companies, Airbnb um, and others, uh, you'll find that uh, when they get started, uh, I, what I can tell you is that there's a pattern. When they get started, uh, they take the stance, we're not responsible for anything. We're just setting up the platform. I think Gores mentioned that. Uh, after a period of time, they find out that they're going to lose business if, if they don't handle some of these disputes. So they get more involved in, this, in these disputes. They were reluctant at first to get involved because they thought that would make them legally liable for whatever. Um, so that, that's the pattern. eBay now gets involved in lots and lots of disputes itself. Um, but here, you've agreed to it. Unless uh, somebody thinks you're not agreeing to it. If I may ask a follow-up question yeah. directly on, on the incentives of the platforms. You mentioned Uber, right? And yeah. uh, something that strikes me 
whoever has used Uber before, you know, if you have to cancel a trip because the driver doesn't arrive in time or not the time that it's stated, and then you can say, well, but we didn't find each other or whatever. So you can easily get a refund even if you had, you know, paid yeah. your flat fee. So I'm wondering, is that kind of leading us into a world where these platforms are doing something similar that the credit companies did uh, before, where mm -hmm. it just becomes a cost of business? And if so, to factor in the dispute resolution part, and if so, what does that mean for justice if it becomes essentially a cost of doing business and is not a real dispute resolution because it's automated and just, you know, cost of doing business? Well, I think uh, that's what it becomes. Uh, I should have mentioned it. I mean, probably the most widely used online dispute resolution process is the one that the credit card companies have uh, called chargeback systems. Uh, it, doesn't satisfy, it doesn't satisfy lots of people, but uh, it does satisfy lots of people because there are lots of disputes. Uh, having recently, just two days ago, been charged $5 by Uber for not showing up uh, when the car arrived, I'm, I'm sympathetic to uh, customers. And, and what we, we do talk about in the book is this issue of uh, whether drivers are employees or independent contractors. Uh, that seems to be on its way to getting settled, and when that gets settled, there will be more, more uh, uh, I think, more likelihood of an online process. This is, uh, this, as I said, my uh, machine is, has its own brain. Uh, I hadn't intended to show this, but uh, this is the IRS. Uh, th this brain is smarter than I am because this is a great, great screen. That's the predictive analytics part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you can read it, uh, read it. Uh, why isn't our? Why aren't our government agencies handling these these disputes well? Um, I would like to turn this off because. Uh, but, uh, the gentleman you saw uh, actually lives around here, and uh, it's the, he's the gentleman in the case that begins uh, begins the book. Uh, he uh, uh, had various medical problems, and he had been to different hospitals, and. Um, Beth Israel, which was where his main uh, doc main doctors were, uh, gave him a chance to uh, send all of his data to Google Health. Google Health doesn't exist anymore, but um, in 2010, Google Health existed. And Google Health made it possible for you to have all of your medical records in one place. Uh, that's a problem still. Uh, your medical records may be with partners, Beth Israel, uh, whatever, and uh, you have different doctors in different places, and maybe the cyber law clinic can figure out a way to solve that, but uh, it's a serious health problem. So Google Health was attractive to this fellow, and, um, and he decided to push the button on the, on the Beth Israel website to send all of his uh, records to Google Health. And almost immediately, uh, on the screen it said, warning, uh, you have all of these diseases. And uh, he was a sick person to begin with, uh, so he didn't like seeing that he had uh, cancer of this and uh, high blood pressure and literally a, a list of things. So what uh, Beth Israel had done, which he quickly figured out, was sent insurance codes to Google rather than clinical diagnoses. Okay, so clinical code, uh, insurance codes don't map particularly well with medical problems. So if you've seen your doctor or somebody in the office trying to figure out what code to put in, uh, there were at that time 7,000 codes, now there's 70,000 codes. It's a complicated mess, frankly. Um, but this was basically, for our purposes, this was an intriguing dispute. So we used it to begin the, 
begin the book. But it also indicates how things go wrong, uh, not when anybody's intending for anything to go wrong. Um, just to follow on your questioners, a colleague of Ethan and mine's at the National Center for Technology and Dispute Resolution, Colin Rule, who was one of the other architects at eBay, gave a presentation once. And he said um, that they figured out through their research that customers would rather lose a dispute quickly than win a dispute over a long period of time, over a really protracted period of time. And that one of the key questions for anyone architecting that kind of dispute resolution system is to figure out how to obtain some kind of justice that is expedient, but that doesn't obey those perverse incentives to just deny people quickly or something like that. Um, Ethan, my question for you is you painted this picture of a early internet that shared so many norms uh, and was such a closely bounded social community that disputes weren't as prevalent. Um, and now we have a much more heterogeneous internet, a much more conflictual one where conflict is a growth industry. Which do you think is easier? Building increasingly large, sophisticated, and elaborate methods of resolving disputes once they occur, or somehow building social norms and technologies that support the social norms that create a common sense of community and behave prophylactically at preventing disputes? Well, I, I'd say the latter is much harder to, uh, to do. Uh, how many of us belong to uh, systems that we find it advantageous to belong to, but we don't really like what's going on? I mean, most of you probably belong to Facebook. You know, Facebook wants you to feel safe. I don't know if anybody feels safe uh, using anything online. But um, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember 1992, the real cutoff when uh, lots of universities let, let uh, students use the internet for free, uh, when the US government allowed commercial activity uh, and uh, that was a debate back then. The researchers said, you know, we've got this system. Nobody gets hurt by it. We get along well. Of course, only a small percentage of the public even knows it exists, uh, but it serves its function. And if you change the rules, uh, not only will you have pornography, which was an obvious one, uh, but you'll have all kinds of uh, conflict. The other side said, we, our economy needs to grow. Well, here's a way for our economy to grow. So all of those things happened. Uh, but, uh, so I don't think you can be nostalgic for what went on back then, but I think you can be concerned about what, what's happening now. Anybody else? Just maybe as a last question, building up on that, how do you think about the interfaces? And you, you address it in the last chapter of the book um, where you talk about the remaining role of courts, right? Yeah. So these technological systems, but then also the human-based systems. Uh, how, how, also going back to the social norms point, how do you see the interaction among these systems? Well, first of all, I think uh, there's no reason why courts uh, can't be more engaged in online dispute resolution. You know, we sa I said, you know, courts, people go to courts rarely. You know, if I asked how many people in this room have uh, actually been a party to a case that went to court other than the small claims court, you know, I'd be surprised if 10 people raised their hand. How many of you have had a, a case in court? Yeah, so maybe less than 10. Uh, there's no reason why uh, the processes that work in the private sector can't frequently work in the public sector. And, and there are examples uh, of this in Michigan. Uh, there's somebody at Michigan Law School who um, runs something called Matterhorn, which has basically runs the courts. Uh, and then there's uh, it's not run by a court, but uh, having received my fair share of parking tickets on Mass Ave, 
Uh, it appeals to me. It's called Do Not Pay. You can look it up. Um, they have, uh, they'll handle your case for you if uh, you want to appeal a parking ticket. But they've uh, designed what they claim are a thousand bots to help people na basically navigate the court system. Uh, so when judges are more technologically familiar, which is one thing holding things back, and maybe budgets are a little better, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of this handled by court. And the, and the thing you might uh, find troublesome is, which I'm surprised no one mentioned, and that is, um, what do you do with when it becomes easier to complain and then you have more cases? So those people who would simply live with whatever problem they had all of a sudden find, well, with two, uh, two clicks of uh, my finger, I can fill out a complaint against anybody. We'll, we'll work on that. Maybe the cyber law clinic can work on that too. So it seems that the next 10 years will be more interesting than the past 10 years in terms of how this story unfolds, whether the emphasis is on more disputes or on more resolution. Please join me in uh, thanking Ethan for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.